Welcome everyone to our webinar from the clinic to the ballot box, how health professionals can promote safe voting in 2020. We are enormously thrilled to have you all here. There were over 250 of you who signed up for this webinar from all across the country and even a few folks internationally as well. We are thrilled to have you all with us. My name is Saranya Lair. I am the founder of Vote Health 2020, which is one of the sponsoring organizations. And I also serve as the head of innovation at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Um, I am going to take us through the next few slides before I turn it over to our hosts for the evening, just to signpost uh, what we'll be spending, how we'll be spending the next hour or so together. Just a reminder to please keep your phone lines muted. And if you've dialed in by phone and also your computer, make sure that your participant ID is connected to your phone line. The team at Health Begins have created this wonderful slide to help uh, guide you if you have any questions. And of course, if you're having any challenges, our wonderful colleague, Maricela, um, you can chat to her and she can help you troubleshoot. We will also be extensively using the chat function during our time together. So please make sure to chat to all participants. We want to hear your questions, your insights, your examples, your ideas. We want to make this as rich and generative as possible so we can share and learn and collectively do this work together. We'll have you get started doing that while I run through some introductions. So we would love for you all to chat in your name, where you are calling from, and a favorite fall activity. It is uh, wonderful fall weather where I am in New Hampshire. I am sorry, I know in some places, especially the West Coast, maybe weather is, is, uh, is unfortunately not as, not as cooperative for you all, and I'm, I'm very sorry for that. Um, I hope there's something you're looking forward to in the fall, and so we would love for everyone to please chat in your name, where you're joining us from today, and a favorite fall activity to get the chat dialogue started. As you're doing that, I just wanted to take a moment to introduce our sponsors. I'm actually gonna start with uh, Dr. Rishi Manchanda, if you're willing to do a quick wave, Rishi. Uh, Dr. Manchanda is the president and CEO of Health Begins and are offering the tech platform for this webinar. We're so grateful to you, Dr. Manchanda, and Maricela, a tech wizard extraordinaire. Rishi was also the creator of RX Vote, and our other uh, sponsor is RX Vote. And Dr. Tom Roberts is leading RX Vote um, uh, currently for 2020 and beyond. He also serves as an oncology fellow at Dana Farber, and I've mentioned myself already, um, Sarah Lair, as part of Vote Health 2020. When uh, Tom, Rishi, and I started conceptualizing this idea, we said, okay, well, if we just, if we wanted to pick kind of our, you know, wish list of people, let's just try, you know, there's no harm in trying, and we are enormously grateful that um, all of them said yes, including uh, Dr. Don Berwick, who is the pres founder and president emeritus of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, as well as a former administrator of CMS and Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, who is the director of the Pediatric Public Health Initiative and a endowed professor of public health at Michigan State University. We will first be hearing from Drs. Berwick and Dr. Hanna, Dr. Hanna Atisha to really level set and contextualize the vital importance of civic engagement and the role of health professionals in promoting civic engagement in a way that improves the health and well-being of all. And then we are enormously privileged to hear from two organizations about how they have operationalized civic engagement and supporting their payers, their, their patients, their peers, their community members in civic engagement, specifically around voter registration and in the context of the pandemic, perhaps even more important, ensuring that each and every person has a safe voting plan. So we'll start and we'll be thrilled to hear from Dr. Talamantes, from, who's a uh, Chief Operating Officer of Ultimed Health Services, and Ms. Jenny Carrion, who is the Assistant uh, to Vice President of Civic Engagement and Government Relations 
at Ultimed, which is on the West Coast um, in, a, in a very busy city. Then we're going to transition, we're going to take a hop on a virtual plane all the way to the East Coast and we'll hear from Miss Ann Lewis, who is the CEO of Care South Carolina, about the efforts uh, in rural South Carolina to help get out the vote, make sure people are registered, and make sure people have a safe voting plan. Then we'll share a few tools and resources with you uh, as, and um, so we can hear from uh, so you can get a sense of how you can take all of these great ideas and begin to operationalize them. And then we'll also make sure to leave lots of time for questions and discussion. So as I noted, please do keep that coming in the chat. With that, I'm going to start, Don, by asking you to please share um, a few remarks. And I will, um, uh, Maricela, if you could please make sure that Don is unmuted, Dr. Don Berwick. Hi, can you hear me okay, Sonia? We can. Thank you, Don. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom and uh, Rishi and Saranya, um, for the chance to spend just a couple minutes uh, with some initial thoughts. Uh, I want to just first say how impressed and grateful I am about what uh, Tom and Rishi and Saranya are doing. And Saranya, a close colleague, uh, her stepping up in leadership in this vote 2020, I, it's I was gonna say it's astounding, but it's actually knowing Saranya, it's not surprising, but it is still astounding. Thank you for what you're doing, Saranya, it's wonderful. And thank you all for joining. Yeah, this is dire. I don't, I just, I don't have words strong enough to explain how I feel about the juncture we're reaching now. Uh, I am scared. Uh, I am also hopeful because good things could happen, but we've got to take over. This is, this is uh, a potential disastrous moment for this country. Um, the lens I use, of course, is the lens of, of health and health care, and that lens includes investment in the structures of health care in our country. We have an administration in place that is suing to take away the Affordable Care Act to pull the rug out from under 20 million people uh, that has steadily eroded Medicaid, that's questioned and uh, insulted and undercut science at every turn, uh, which affects us not just during the COVID period, but uh, the integrity of our agencies and our democratic institutions is at stake. Uh, we also have a bigger lens through social determinants of health. If we're going to be a healthy country, we've got to be a compassionate country. We've got to be one that invests in uh, helping people who needs, need help to do that generously and openly and without regard to uh, people's backgrounds or, or the color of their skin. Uh, we need to invest in, in ending hunger, ending homelessness, uh, it, it, we have an agenda to make communities healthy because healthcare is a repair shop. It can't make people healthy. It just can only restore the effects uh, or try to overcome the effects of conditions that make them sick. Ask Ann Lewis about that. She deals every day in a safety net system trying to help people do better. And that's social determinants. We need a government and a leadership that unblinkingly invests in that instead of dividing us and blaming the unfortunate and uh, uh, don't get me started. And then there's a, to me, there's actually a higher order issue, which is, which uh, is, it, it's a little bit stiff necked. It's a little bit maybe uh, arrogant, but it's morality. It's morality. It has to do with what kind of country we want to be with respect to our moral nature. Uh, I want a country that's equitable, that's compassionate, that is just, that believes in, in the value of, of human progress and the, the value of, of, of children and elders not a country that's being led the way it is now. It's going, we're going backwards. I, I've called for a moral, a campaign on moral determinants of health, working on hunger and homelessness, working on civic integrity, working on, on immigration policy that's, that's, that's compassionate for Pete's sake, uh, working on, on climate change, which is, uh, oh, look at the damage we're running into. We need, we need leadership. We haven't got it. And this is by the way, not just the White House, it's the Senate. So how do we, take this on. You're all busy at your professional work. Sorry, the job got bigger. We've got to engage. There, there, there's no other way. There's no, there, the bystander seat is not, it, it's, it's a negative seat right now because you're allowing damage to occur and we got to stop it. We have to stop it. I think that voting is key. I think it is, you know, as democratic institutions have been undercut, as voting uh, rights are being threatened, uh, we, we, we've got to not stand for it. And that means showing up. And I think the, the vote 2020 and other uh, leadership acts we're, actions we're, we're seeing here are absolutely essential. We've got to show up on November 3rd and get this country back on track. So thank you for what you're doing uh, and uh, vote, get a hundred other people to vote, get a thousand other people to vote and, and 
we stand a chance of taking this country back. And if we don't, I, I dread, I dread the scenario. It's time to take over. Sarania, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Don. And we will put uh, a link to the, the reference Don made about the moral determinants of health. Don published that piece recently in JAMA. And so we will make sure that that link is available to you all in the chat. He spoke about the moral determinants of health back in December, and he, uh, which is truly what inspired Vote Health 2020. And he told every single one of us, that audience of 6,000, you have to do four things. You need to write, speak, work, and vote. Um, and we hope that we will make it easier for you to do all four of those things and to also help your peers and patients and communities do those as well. I would like to turn things over to Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha now, who many of you know, um, who personifies all four of those things and personifies the, her story and her work demonstrate the inextricable link between policy and health outcomes and the role that healthcare providers play as advocates for those most in need and those most vulnerable among us. Dr. Hanna Atisha, Marcella, would you please unmute Dr. Uh, Hanna Atisha? I think I'm unmuted, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me to be part of this. Um, the, the work of civic engagement and um, voting is something near and dear to me. Uh, when I was in college as an undergrad, I helped start an organization called Voice Your Vote, which institutionalized voter registration on campuses. And then the first thing I did when I started medical school, um, it was a different presidential election, and I, I won't share the year, but it was a while ago. Um, and we also worked to um, institutionalize voter registration with all our new medical students. So this has always been something that to me as a, as a pediatrician, as a healthcare provider, is critical to our work. Um, and uh, personally, I, I don't think, um, you know, I never would have realized how important it is to participate in democracy than through my experience with the Flint water crisis. And I just want to kind of share with you um, how it can directly impact the health of the patients that we are privileged to serve. I mean, I don't think you need any more examples with the pandemic, but I want to share um, an example that, that is close to home for me. Uh, so Flint, uh, the lessons of what happened in Flint are the lessons that are playing out in, in our nation right now. They are the lessons of the importance of good governance that values public health. It's the lessons of the need to respect science and, and scientists and, and the medical uh, profession. Uh, the lessons also include the need to, to um, invest in um, public health infrastructure, how we need to be proactive and preventative rather than reactive and unable to handle a crisis. Uh, the lessons of, of Flint also include the, the role of disparities. Um, Flint was this, you know, terrible health and environmental injustice. And, and that's also what we're seeing in the pandemic. Um, but Flint was also a lesson of what happens when you take away democracy. Uh, so if you kind of go to the root of the Flint the Flint crisis, and there's there's many historic roots. Um, but in the near term, it was a story of what happened uh, through a gerrymandered legislature uh, that appointed an unelected emergency manager that against the will of the people, against the state electorate, um, you know, changed our water source in a, in a move to save money. So no regard for public health, no regard for children's health, and no regard for democracy. So when that emergency manager finally testified um, in Congress in front of, um, God bless him, Elijah Cummings, who was uh, overseeing the, that oversight committee, um, he asked the emergency manager, like, why didn't you, like, listen to the people? Why didn't you, uh, you know, they were saying their water was brown and yellow and their kids were getting sick. Why didn't you do anything about that? And he said, I didn't have to. I didn't have to because I wasn't accountable to them. I was, I was only accountable to kind of the higher ups um, and I didn't have to respond to, the, to you know, what the, the electorate w was concerned about. And that to me is a striking example of what happens when you take away democracy. When you take away um, the, the will of the electorate um, and the voices of, of really the most vulnerable among us. Um, and central to the restoration um, of the health of our community is the role of participatory democracy and self-determination and making sure that people's voices are heard and that we do everything in our power um, to make sure that once again, the patients and the communities that we are privileged to serve have the ability 
um, to exercise not only the right to vote, but also to for us to help elevate their voices. Um, so for me, it is a direct connection between um, voting um, and the absolute health of our communities. Uh, fortunately, in 2018, Michigan voted for a new governor, and we have directly seen the consequences of leadership that cares for public health. Uh, that respects science um, and is governed by what's best for communities. Um, but we need those kind of things to absolutely happen at the national level. Um, another quick lesson of, of my story is that, you know, when I finally spoke up, you know, when I spoke up in Flint, I was kind of the last domino in our story. So many people were raising their voices, amazing moms and pastors and activists and journalists and scientists and students and the list goes on. Um, but when that person spoke with that long white coat and all those degrees after her name, finally things began to change. So for those of you out there in healthcare, don't think that this is in your lane. Don't think that there's somebody else who's going to do this work. Don't think that you're not going to be respected and listened to. Because when medicine speaks, people listen. Medicine is still a very highly regarded and credible profession. Um, so use the incredible power that you all have. Um, and like Dr. Berwick said, probably the, the most important election of our time. Uh, you know, I, I hope you like me are you know, I, I can't sleep. I mean, this keeps me up at night, the state of our nation, but we have this amazing opportunity, especially with efforts like this, to rebuild and to reimagine um, and to put kind of public health and democracy at the forefront. Uh, so thank you for allowing me be, to be part of this. I'm so inspired, despite kind of all the darkness that's happening right now, um, I'm inspired by all the innovation and the organizing um, and the passion by, by so many folks. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hannah, Tisha. Thank you for, I don't know how, there's so many things to say thank you for that I would take the whole hour, but thank you for highlighting how much this matters locally too. It's not just about who's president. It is about who, our select board, our sheriffs, our prosecutors, um, our public health officials. So thank you for highlighting how important this is locally and, and statewide as well as federally. Thank you for highlighting the role the, the pivotal and vital role that health professionals play um, in this work. And thank you for being an advocate for your patients, for those kids um, and for that community, because um, it made a difference for them and it made a difference for all of us who are inspired um, by your work. So thank you so much. Thank you to Dr. Don Berwick and Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha for really grounding us in why this work matters at all levels of our society uh, today and in the future. Now we're going to hear from two incredible organizations on opposite coasts of how they are doing this work every single day in their clinics, in their care settings, and in their communities. We will start with Ultimed and Dr. Tal uh, Talamantis. And Dr. Talamantis, I will be advancing the slides. So if you just say next slide, I'll go, I'll, I'll be sure to, uh, to advance those slides for you. Thank you. Excellent. Good morning, everyone. A real honor to be uh, amongst so many distinguished uh, panelists today. I uh, really appreciate the invitation. Uh, as Ultimed, we're the largest federally qualified health center in, in the country. Um, a tremendous amount of responsibility uh, and our roots are really within the civil rights movement. And, and we understand that uh, many giants before us came to really set the foundation for us to be successful. And as a chief operating officer, I would say that uh, being able to support this uh, is incredibly important and, and an investment, an investment to make sure that in our clinics, uh, we are uh, being responsible for our patients. And, and as a healthcare professional, as a physician, um, also, bringing the needs of my patients uh, to the ballot box. Next slide, please. From civic engagement to health equity, uh, we all understand that inequities are in health are avoidable. These are uh, circumstances that sometimes not only are unnecessary, but unjust and deeply rooted in the social determinants of health. And for us, as we see our patients, uh, we know that there are policies, processes, practices, sometimes people that not only intentionally or unintentionally uh, exclude communities of color or those that are of low socioeconomic status. And so for us, civic engagement has been an opportunity to really be more inclusive uh, to support equitable policies, processes, practices, and people. 
And we really see this as a, a tremendous opportunity. So next slide, please. We want to move from a current state where our healthcare professionals, uh, those that have the most education oftentimes are the ones that are, have the economic stability uh, and are not voting and or are not being a good example for our um, staff and employees and, and patients, more importantly, to a future state. We want to move to a future state uh, as, been, as has been shared, um, where we as healthcare professionals take our responsibility uh, to demonstrate that we care, that we vote, um, that our vote is our patient's health. Uh, it's a way for us to address the social determinants of health. Next slide, please. We also understand that we are amongst uh, the very few left, uh, most trusted uh, messengers in our communities. Uh, these are communities of color, low income. Many times our patients are coming to us not only with clinical medical needs, but they have other needs, social needs. Uh, and they, they trust us that we're gonna do more uh, than just uh, write a prescription. They want us to, do, uh, to, to get involved in the community and, and be able to advocate for them. Um, so we, we are leveraging civic engagement and we've seen already uh, not only an opportunity for us to have great conversations. Ha are you registered to vote? Is anyone in your family able to register to vote? Are you gonna vote? Not necessarily telling them how to vote, but letting them know that sometimes the conditions that they're facing um, are ways that we can vote to change those. And so ch championing uh, both civic engagement, our efforts in our clinics has been an opportunity to, to wake us up to not only where we come from, but really that we do have a privilege to take care of our patients, their families in the community uh, and so this has been a journey for us that we wanted to share with you. And I'm going to go ahead and, and, and turn it over to Jenny to really share some of the concrete steps you can take to join uh, this effort. Thank you, Dr. Dalamantes, and thank you for inviting us to be part of this important conversation. Ultimate's My Vote, My Health, Mi Voto, Mi Salud model is a nonpartisan program that empowers Latinos and millennials to take an active role in political elections that way we can protect access to quality health care and challenge existing local civic engagement policies that impact their everyday lives. The challenge has been that local civic engagement campaigns historically, as well as get out the vote campaigns, have overlooked outreach to Latinos and millennials living in low income communities. And this has created a cycle of communities that are not voting and are disengaged and not part of the political and policy process that address the social determinants of health and improve overall well-being. So we're doing this exciting campaign. We do a five-touch model inside our clinics that include um, um, someone talking to our patients about uh, when the election is during check-in. In the waiting rooms, there's commercials and PSAs on when the election is, what propositions mean, um, where to go if you have any questions. When our patient goes and sees um, the Alvianos for vitals, there's posters there about when the election is. Um, and then when the patient sees the provider, our providers are wearing vote pins that, you know, you know remind patients to vote. And after they check out, um, they received an after patient summary with when the election is. In California, we have 22 days until the election. Um, and I know um, that in the East Coast, we got 50 days. So we still have a lot of time to make sure that we are engaged and that we have a systematic effort to get this done. Our five touch model also does an external process. This includes phone banking to low propensity voters in a five mile radius from all of our clinics. We also do door to door canvassing. And this has been the most productive because we go to people's doors even during COVID in, um, in PPE and we're wearing ultimate shirts, ultimate hats and um, our community members are like, you're coming from my doctor's office. And we're like, yes, your doctor says hello. She, um, she wanted to make sure I come to remind you that the election is coming up um, and wanted to see if you had any questions about the propositions that are gonna impact your healthcare. We then do text messages um, we do PSAs and commercials, and then we also offer rides to the polls for anyone who may need it. Next slide. 
And in the primary election, um, we're really proud to share that we spoke to over 42,000 low propensity voters. We knocked and we called on over half a million uh, low propensity voters throughout the state. We partnered with some um, health care centers, FQHCs um, in southern um, in the southern part of California in the San Ysidro region um, and then all the way up to Oakland. Uh, we wanted to do this to show that this is not just a model that can work inside an ultimate healthcare setting but can work in any setting and that it's important to be done throughout all of our all of our models of, of healthcare. Next slide. And UCLA did a report that validated this work. It showed that um, 12 per, that out of out of the um, half a million calls and, and knocks that we did, we saw a turnout of 46.57 percent. Some of these precincts that we're talking about, we usually have single digit numbers, um, and we also saw 12.72 percent increase. Uh, of low propensity voters. These are voters that nobody else is reaching out to. 90% of the people that we spoke with didn't even know there was an election. That's why our program to increase civic participation by using our health centers that offer voter registration, bilingual um, education materials, flex voting opportunities. But more importantly, we offer our doctors who are number one trusted messengers. Next slide. And we know that communities of high rates of voter participation have more political and social power and are more positioned to successfully change um, the policies that impact them. So the UCLA study did a control, a placebo, and a treatment group. And it showed that while we had a 12% increase generally, when we were able to have three touches with each community member or each patient, there was an increase of 17%, 17.87% voter turnout increase. We also saw that if we were to impact and, and do this model throughout the state, contacting all low propensity Latino voters, in the primary election, that would have been an increase of 650,000 new voters that would have showed up um, to the polls. So we're actively talking to foundations because we want to spread this work. We know that it is important um, and we want to be able to share uh, the importance because if Altamed is the only one that's doing it, we're not gonna win. We're only gonna win if we collectively as healthcare organizations and institutions take this work on. Next slide. So we met voters where, where, where they're at. We partnered with the registrar's office and we put flex voting at all of our pay sites. And this was the most exciting thing for us because we had seniors and we had uh, folks that uh, are patients that had never voted before that were voting. And, and when we were asking them, um, how come this is your first time voting? They said, you know, they didn't want to bother their, their children to take them to vote or, or their caretaker, or they didn't even know where to go to vote. Um, so doing these mechanics and making voting easier for our patients has been really a, a huge win for us, um, which is why we're prioritizing flex voting and um, drop off ballot boxes at all of our clinics, um, especially right now during, during the pandemic. That way we want to focus on minority and working class communities who often face the greatest socioeconomic challenges to be at the forefront of this work. Next slide. We did this work by uh, implementing a toolkit. We, I spoke a little bit about, about our, our five touch model, uh, but we also have material checklists. So a cheat sheet for all of you. We, we know that not all of you have political scientists inside of, of your organizations. So we did all this work so that you can just download it, put your logos on it and, and get to work. We want to make sure that we make it as easy as, as possible. Um, and if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them as well. Um, next slide. All of our materials are edible. Our, our, our campaigns can be, can be downloaded very easily and all this information is free. So if you go on myvotemyhealth.org, um, you can just put your, your logos on it. More importantly, what our materials have done is we did focus groups. So we did materials that we know resonated that weren't a bunch of dissertations. We know all of our medical professionals like to, you know, read and, and, and write long, long informational materials, but that necessarily doesn't resonate with our patients. So we wanted to make sure that that, that work was, was easy and, um, and, and free for anyone to use. Next slide. 
And we did, we, we, now when we've been doing these trainings, we promote three levels. We know that we think of Ultimate as the Costco version, right? But we know that everybody don't, doesn't have that access or have those resources or have, have received the foundation support. So we want to encourage you to do one of these levels. So level one will be, would recommend doing PSAs on all of your TVs in your waiting rooms, screensavers, hold messages. Anytime you call an ultimate location, there's an on hold message about when the election is and what the propositions mean. There's um, QR code signage throughout our clinics, social media, and our toolkits and trainings are, are available as well. So all this information is free, won't cost you anything, and can be downloaded at our website for free. The second level, um, if you want to take it a, a different notch, uh, do vote by mail handouts. Uh, a lot of people are now uh, going um, signing up for vote by mail in California, all of us will be receiving a vote by mail um, in, on October 6. So talk about that so that people feel more comfortable that it's safe, that you can trust it, and that it's important that you do it early and, and safely. Um, in your exam rooms, you can put posters after patient visit messages on every time you hand, you know, your one of your clients, um, one of those documents, and also have voter registration kiosks. Um, so that after the um, the doctor speaks with the patient, they can go. You have somewhere to refer them to versus you know go to a website that they might not have Wi-Fi access. And then the third the third level is half patient signed up pledge cards. We know that when a patient fills out a pledge card, it gives them a different um, level of commitment to actually show up and do it. Provider business cards. Our doctors, we provide little business cards for them that they keep in their lab coats and they hand to their patients about important dates or there's a QR code about you know, our website um, or what the propositions mean. Uh, contact your registrar's office, start a partnership with them. It wasn't an easy partnership, um, but after a lot of um, negotiating, we're able to have you know, flex voting at our clinics, vote by mail um, boxes um, at our sites. Um, text bank with your staff. Text banking has been so productive for us. We've been able to contact so many more patients and our staff and have that one-on-one -on -one communication with them. And then coordinate volunteers to go on GOTV precinct walks. If you're in California, please reach out. I can pull up a precinct for you very easily and send it to you. And also um, do some of the materials that you may need as you're talking to, to any of your, if your community members. And I would, we always recommend a five mile um, radius for this work. Next slide. And to close, just want to say thank you. Want to put, uh, you know, our website information on there, but also remind you that, you know, this pandemic has put an extreme amount of pressure in an already vulnerable health system. And as doctors and educators and healthcare professionals, you know, in this era of sickness, voting is medicine and our health depends on it. So we look forward to working with you and making sure we see some changes in the next 50 days. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, you know, I know I've been studying the work that you've been doing and yet every time you speak, I just, it's so inspiring and uh, amazing what you've been doing. Um, thank you for doing this work and also thank you for being so generous in sharing it with others. You are incredibly generous with your time, with your coaching and with your resources. So thank you so much. I hope you uh, maybe take a moment and look in the chat to see all of the love and praise um, and celebration uh, coming your way. And I'm sure you'll also see them in your inbox sometime very soon. Um, I'm gonna turn us though to, uh, to we're gonna move to the East Coast now into South Carolina. Um, and we're gonna hear from Ms. Ann Lewis, who is the CEO of Care South Carolina. And then um, feel free to keep putting your reflections and ideas, examples in the chat. We'll preserve it um, and hopefully have a little bit of time for discussion um, at the end of the call. So Anne, let me please turn things over to you. And again, I'll advance your slides as you um, just let me know. Sure, uh, just a sound check. Can you hear me? Perfect, Anne. All right, all right. So um, Ultimate, I am blown away. I had so much takeaways from that that I was, um, it was almost like frantically hearing everything. Oh, I, amazing. Um, so folks, <clears throat> I will switch you over to the, to the East Coast a little bit. Uh, I want to preface my remarks a little bit. I'm, I'm just an old hippie. 
uh, to be very, very candid. Back in the late 60s and the early 70s, um, that's my roots in terms of community activation. And folks, it made a difference. It, it, it did, it made such a difference in so many things as we move forward in the 80s. Um, I know some people feel a little discouraged about what difference will it make if I you know, go out and do anything. Trust me, it does make the difference. So put your hippie garb on and uh, let's join 2020 and show that we really can make a difference because we will, we will. So next slide, Saranya. Um, just as a very, very quick overview, we are a small organization. We're not a large organization. We also are an FQHC. Uh, we are located in a very underserved area. We have a pretty good wide array of services. Um, we only have about 39, 38,000 unique patients. Our staff is fairly small, um, only about 570. So I wanted to give you a little bit of perspective. I know. There are many of you out there that have even less resources, but there are also many of you who have more resources. So move right along. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> the big question on voter registration and voting that we have always um, gotten questions about here in South Carolina is why? Why bother? Uh, I, the, the story in Flint was absolutely moving. Um, I, I was really, there was so much information there that I had never heard. Uh, but remember that all politics is local. So as I thought back over why, why voter registration and voting is so very important, not just for all the points that Don so eloquently made, we have got to make this change, but also to bring it on home. In 2010 in South Carolina, the gubernatorial election was determined by only about 60,000 votes. Now let that settle in for a minute. We're not a really large state. We had a pretty good voter registration. Uh, we had 74% of the population that was registered. That's about 2.6 million. Only 26% voted, which was about 690,000. So if the vote for the governor rested on about 60,000 votes, that tells you that the loser in that uh, race only got 630 versus the winner, the 690. There were consequences to this. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail. So y'all can go back and look up on the web who was the actual winner in that 2010. But there was a major consequence, and that consequence was directly out of the governor's office. It made massive impact on our legislators and on our communities even. And that is that Medicaid expansion was determinately blocked. Now, next slide. Most of us kind of know what this means, the consequences of uh, the failure for states to move forward in Medicaid expansion. But this really was slammed home. And this is some of the data that came out of the Commonwealth Fund uh, in a study that they did back in 2019. FQHCs are not the most stable organizations across the US. You know, we, we live on a pretty thin margin. Sometimes um, we get snatched hither, thither, and thought foe with these margins. But according to what the Commonwealth Fund, you see the difference between the financial stability, uh, whether or not the organization was able to fund different services and make expansions and have capital improvement. Uh, a lot of equipment, a lot of buildings are aging and the ability to, to make affordable care to more patients with expansions. FQHCs in non-Medicaid expansion states fared significantly worse than in those states. In South Carolina, the direct consequence in an analysis done by the RCHN Foundation was a $2 billion loss. 
Well, at that time, there was about 16 community health centers, and I don't know about all the other 15, but we, we at CARE of South Carolina could have really made a difference with those additional funds. There are consequences everywhere across our nation. Next slide. So looking at our history in voter registration, we do have a past in this. Our board chair at CARE South Carolina, and you know at FQXCs, or maybe you don't know, there is a federal requirement that the majority of the board have uh, are direct users of the services of the FQHC. So that adds a pretty good dimension uh, to how board representation uh, is achieved. And our board chair uh, had had a political presence in the past. And frankly, it was his idea that we add a question actually to our patient registration form that asks, are you registered to vote? or would you like assistance in registering to vote? Now this goes back just about um, 10 years. We've been doing this for quite a while. Uh, did we get pushback? Yeah, we did. We got pushback. Uh, there were people, even staff, that are going, this is private. This is information that, you know, CARE South Carolina has no right to have this information. Why are you asking this? But we persisted. Uh, it is very important information. And we made sure that we had the ability to be able to do what we asked, and that is give assistance in registering to vote with community health workers and outreach staff, uh, all trained uh, in voter registration. In South Carolina, um, going back over 15 years, there was an organization, at one time it was known as the Benefit Bank. It is now known as SC Thrive but it was a web-based resource uh, by which we could uh, accomplish an online registration. So that gave us uh, a pretty easy way to be able to assist our patients. So oh, about 10 years ago, we were able to roll out some of these um, uh, initial steps, shall I say, in voter registration. Present though, next slide, as we look at today, and as we truly believe everything that Don has said and what you've heard from Altamed and what you've heard from the Flint, Michigan stories, um, the old hippie has come back out in me. <laughs> it is time to get out there and motivate, inspire, and community organize. Uh, so Rania has given us a huge number of resources. Uh, we've developed flyers. We are using our web page to give patients assistance and to ask questions and to um, begin making some inroads into folks that are interested in voter registration. Um, next slide, please. We're taking every opportunity and every place that we can. Although Altamed, thank you. You've given me a lot more ideas. Uh, we are getting registrations. We are, we are having some impact. Uh, back after the, um, the um, celebration back in August about the women's right to vote became uh, uh, effective, uh, we began to get a lot more activity. We've taken, taken um, the, um, the advantage of that particular Hallmark event. We got registrations from Facebook, Absentee ballots are, are going forward. And this, this data, by the way, has even been updated uh, from that website. Uh, we've got some, some registrations, 37 absentee ballots. It's certainly not the half a million, which I am just blown away that Altamed experience. But remember, the 2010 election was lost by only 60,000 votes. So in South Carolina, a little bit helps. Next slide. We believe that our success is going to be uh, seven ways, seven times. We've learned many, many a time that adult learning and adult changes really have to have a, a lot of different opportunities. And of course, we've had experience with social media. Uh, we are doing a Facebook Live blog on Friday mornings. And that has gotten a lot of activity. 
uh, it's it's fun and um, and and we're we're putting forth a a vote message in that. As a matter of fact, I think that our leader in that, Marette Calhoun, is going to actually have someone that is going to be on some future blogs to really give some support and directions. Uh, we're generating leadership emails. I really like the point that was made uh, that our community trusts those of us that are in the medical community and that are, well, in our case, part of CARE South Carolina, they trust us. So when leadership begins to say things, whether, and, and really and truly, whether it's medical leadership or even executive leadership, I think that there is a, a, a large amount of community respect and, uh, and they'll, they'll hear the message. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity in taking advantage of that. Of course, the web page, the lobby presence that Ultimate talked about, we've been doing quite a bit in that. And then, of, of course, now I've picked up on some more ideas and I can fill in those blanks for five, six, and seven in the additional ways. Um, I want to close with one thing that I, I, it was sort of a mantra back in the late 60s and the early 70s, because it really applies now. If not us, then who? Who's going to take this? Who's going to assure that we have the changes that we must have in place for the health and well-being of our nation and ourselves? And if not now, then when? Now is the time. To make it simple, we're fired up and ready to go in South Carolina. Thank y'all. Thank everyone who's contributed so much to this. Thank you so much, Anne. I love the residents also from um, your seven ways, seven times, and the five touch model. I think what you're what you're seeing here is uh, everything helps. So anything that you can do, it might be the tipping point. It might be the thing that makes the difference. I know there's a lot of information here. There's a lot happening in the chat. What we're gonna do is Tom and I are gonna spend about five minutes talking you through some of the tools and resources that we have available to you all. And we'd love for you to keep adding in your ideas and your examples and your resources as well. So Tom, let me turn things over uh, to you and we'll do a little bit of back and forth here, I think. And Tom, you might be on mute. So Marcel, I don't know if you can unmute Tom. Um, I can't hear you, Tom. I don't know, Maricela. Tom should be unmuted now. Tom, do you want to? Tom, you might be muted on your end. Let's try. All right. I'm going to, maybe I'll go ahead and get us started. And then, uh, Tom, just feel free to jump right in uh, when, when um, if and when you can. So we wanted to try to make things uh, a little bit simple. You can uh, tell we wanted to just um, think about different ways that you all could engage. So the first is showing just as simple as putting up some flyers um, in various locations. The second is telling, the third is asking, and the fourth is outreach. So it just gets broader and broader and broader. For the show, we have a number of resources available to you all. We have flyers like this um, that Anne mentioned. You see these QR codes here. Anything here can be customized to your organization. If you are an improvement fiend like Anne is, Anne wanted to know what, thing, what intervention was driving the most registrations and absentee ballot requests for her and CARE South Carolina. So um, we'll, we'll make sure you'll see all of these in the chat, of course, but um, some flyers. So just things to put out there to show people more passively, just having it available, tell. Uh, there's a number of uh, flyers or resources that you can hand to people um, to share with them specific information about um, their voting uh, dates and locations. RxVote has these by state. 
You also see on the right hand side of your screen um, a lot of just sample social media uh, examples. Again, all of those could can be customized as well as emails to your colleagues. You can again ask for hyperlinks and QR codes that are customized to your organization so that you can get a sense of how many individuals uh, you help to register as a result of your efforts. We are powered by the nonpartisan, not for profit vote.org. So, no personally identifying information will ever be shared, uh, but simply you were, you were able to help this unique number of people verify their status, this number of people register, this number of people request their absentee ballots. That is the data that will be provided back to you if you wish. Let me go to ask. Let's see, Tom. Let's let me try one more time to see if we can. I think so. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Okay, Perfect. Great. Tom. Sorry, I'm not sure what was happening there, but um, uh, either way, so, so I'm back now. So yeah, so thanks for um, uh, uh, letting us join here. So to highlight, so uh, Saranya sort of uh, mentioned the way that we've been thinking with sort of the more effort that you're able to kind of do some of the institutional change as, you know, Ultimate sort of vividly illustrates the more we can, you can increase the number of people that you reach. And so the next step in this process we thought of is ask. And this is where we sort of start proactively having these conversations. You know, there's been a lot of information in the chat about how you do this in a non-political way. Um, and uh, these uh, conversation guides that we have are some sort of resources that we've tried to create to help give some examples of the non-political language that you can use, try to help redirect patients if they do ask questions about who should I vote for, because those are conversations we don't want to get into. Um, and, you know, one thing to mention in these, I think it's worth highlighting in 2020, um, obviously COVID has made sort of all of this work take on sort of new urgency in the sense we don't want anybody going to the polls on election day um, if they have health issues and, and don't, don't want them to put themselves at risk. It also gives us an opportunity to talk to patients using neutralizing language because there's never been a more clear connection between voting and health. And so these conversation guides, you know, particular to this year, use that sort of increased importance to uh, give some examples of how you can use that language. Thanks, Tom. And then the final is uh, getting creative and thinking about what you might be able to do outside of your four walls. I have to say these med students uh, and these students are just they're just great. Um, so, so one option I think as, as the, uh, Jenny from Ultimed was noting is actually doing some knocking on doors um, in safe ways um, if people are able to do so. What you see, uh, the picture you see is some students who just made, took their QR codes and turned them into stickers, which we have templates for, put them on their PPE and had them at a, a COVID pop-up testing site. Um, and then uh, I keep forgetting how competitive uh, doctors are, but the students in Florida also created a competition amongst themselves because they want to know which school is going to uh, help register the most people. So, you know, whatever uh, is exciting and motivating to you, that's part of what makes this work so wonderful is the ability to share and learn and create and celebrate together in this important work. Um, so these are just a couple examples. You'll have all of these. Um, they're all accessible via our websites and our Google Drives. Um, and we'll also share some of the key links with you after um, this webinar as well. We'll have the recordings available to you um, and the slide set. So I know we are getting pretty close to time. And so I wanted to do two things. Um, I wanted to highlight, and I know, and Tom mentioned this, a question that often was in the chat. There's two primary questions we often get is one, how do I have these conversations um, with people I care for? And at the Rx Vote tools and scripts, I think are a really helpful way to think about how to have those conversations and do some modeling so you feel comfortable having it in a nonpartisan way. The other issue we often get is pushback from leadership, although we have a lot of leaders on the phone who might be able to weigh in. Um, so maybe any of you who are health system or healthcare leaders, uh, sometimes, especially when it's the students who want to try to operationalize these efforts in their care settings, they say, nope, we're not allowed to do that. It's, it's partisan. You can't do voter registration efforts in your organizations. We did put in the chat, and I'll just um, emphasize it again. There's two documents that we created, or one that we created and one that the American Hospital Association created that talks about the legal and legislative underpinning 
that encourages organizations, including healthcare organizations, to do voter registration efforts as long as they are nonpartisan. So I encourage you to also take a look at those resources and have those in case that is a barrier that you come, uh, that happens for you. And then again, any leaders, if you've had that happen to you or if you've had a way to, uh, to kind of um, message that, I think that would be great to hear. And then I will turn things uh, to Tom to see if there's anything I missed, but you know, when you have Donna and you can't not ask this question. Uh, so Don famously uh, uh, would, you know, sometimes when these, I, these challenges can seem so large and there's so much you can do, it can feel overwhelming. And he would say, okay, all right, well, what could we do by next Tuesday? Could you just, is it Monday today? Okay, well, how about, yeah, so next, next Tuesday. So give yourself, give yourself a little grace, give yourself till next Tuesday. Um, but he'd say, all right, well, you know, well, just what, what could you do, do you think? Well, what's one thing you might be able to try by next Tuesday? So as we're closing um, this work, we would love to have each of you, if you're able and you're willing to chat in one thing that you can commit to doing by next Tuesday in service of this important work. While you're doing that, Tom, is there anything that was key in the chat that perhaps I missed that we want to make sure to elevate? Yeah, so just one thing to add, um, you know, it, the uh, we're really in the sort of prime time to be working on this issue for the 2020 election cycle. And in addition to that, you know, hopefully this is a real opportunity for all of us to start building for the future to, to build these organizations like Altamed has been doing over the past few years. But just in terms of this election cycle, you know, it's worth highlighting that um, the first voter registration dates in the first states are um, generally in the range of October 7th to 9th. So about uh, three to three and a half weeks from now. So this is really prime time to be trying to get people registered, have these conversations early. And then in terms of 2020 with safe voting, you know, it's worth highlighting many states have made changes to the rules this year. So that actually 43 states in the country, you can have a request an absentee ballot with no excuse. And in the remaining seven states, actually most, uh, many of them have, uh, the excuses you can use are ones that apply to huge numbers of our patients. For example, several of them, all you have to do is be over the age of 65, which, you know, lots of our patients that we see regularly qualify for that. So there's great opportunities for us to really help our patients in another level. Um, in terms of things that came up in the, in the chat, you know, I will mention that uh, this, all of these slides will make them available as well as the recording. So uh, anyone who sort of got in halfway, you can uh, catch up on that. And then um, exactly as uh, Saranya already mentioned, you know, one question that I think is worth highlighting that wasn't addressed in the chat so much, it was, was asked um, uh, by Rick, how can we cultivate equity and thought leadership development movements to redress some of the injustices we've been working on? Um, and I think Saranya has been uh, giving some examples of how we can sort of build a movement and all work together. Um, maybe I'll uh, uh, direct that question to Don if he can weigh in um, to just sort of talk more about the uh, importance of kind of working to, you know, sort of building on all of this. So Don, you get to bring us home. How we, how do, we're all here, we're all thrilled. Vote Help started because of your provocation in December. How do we build this movement together? Geometry. Um, I think that the, uh, what we know about the kind of mobilization you're engaged in is that there's, a, there's an expansion factor. So I would urge you to take the actions yourself and then find five others to take the action and keep that, keep that geometric, uh, architecture going because we need to amplify the numbers that Ann gave us. They're big, but they're doable. I mean, the number of people that could be reached here is really, is really phenomenal. The, I think uh, two other quick comments. One is the comfort level for us, mainly as clinicians of bringing this kind of conversation into the clinical setting, as you heard some of our exemplars do, we have to, we have to come to terms with that. I have, and I think that that's a conversation we need to keep alive and going that, that uh, voting is health. And, and that, that to me, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a set, it's a mental model that I think uh, Serrano has helped me uh, embrace as, uh, as you all are. So thank you for that. I did post in the chat a somewhat edgier idea. I am involved in a whole series of virtual meetings, some fundraisers, some not, 50, 60 people at a time. And we're looking for other hosts between now and November 3rd. So if you uh, are interested in that, I put my email in the chat. I will immediately connect you with the architecture that, uh, of the people that are doing that. That's another way to get involved in, uh, and work at this process. But again, thank you so much for your leadership. 
uh, Tom and Sarenya and Risha and all, Rishi and all of you for joining. Thank you. I know we're right at time. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you again to Dr. Rishi Manchanda from Health Begins, Dr. Tom Roberts from Rx Vote, for Dr. Talamentes, for Jenny, for Anne, for Don, for Mona. I just thank you all for everything that you are doing. Thank you for the inspiration. Thank you for sharing your enthusiasm and expertise so generously with us. Thank you to all of you in the chat for sharing your questions, ideas, and encouragement. We are here as a community. We are here to help ensure in the most nonpartisan way that every single person that we know and care for and care about is able to register to vote and to vote safely uh, this fall. So please join us, please connect with us. Let's continue to share, learn and celebrate together. Thank you all.